there, my name is Ollie, and in this video I'm going to show you how the factory method pattern works by walking you through a real world problem it was created to solve and how it would solve it. But before I get to any code, let's talk a bit about the factory method pattern. So what is it? Well, it's a creational pattern that was created to allow instances of a class to be constructed without knowing what that class is, removing the reliance on a single implementation. This is typically achieved by having an interface that contains a factory method, most commonly called make or create, which has a return type that is an interface. You will often find that the actual factory method is static or the whole factory is a singleton. When the method is static but the class isn't a singleton, the method is sometimes referred to as a virtual constructor. Let's look at some code, starting with this class, data service. Its job is to retrieve and persist datasets to some form of persistent storage. The exact specifics of how it does this are not relevant right now. The get method takes an integer representing the dataset's ID and returns an array of the data. And the set method takes an array of data which it will persist and return the new ID. The service is used by the data controller. This is a HTTP controller, part of the MVC architectural pattern. This is something I will cover in the future in a separate video. To put it simply, a controller receives input in the form of a HTTP request and returns output in the form of a HTTP response. Within this application, there will be mappings that pair URLs with controllers and methods. In this example, the URL for retrieving the dataset is mapped to the get method on the controller and the URL for persisting datasets is mapped to the set method on the same controller. These methods make up the bulk of the datasets API, which initially deals with JSON data. Fortunately, PHP has first party JSON support through the JSON extension. Since the data service get method always returns an array, we can just use the JSON encode function in the response. We're also going to set the content type header so anything using the API knows that the content is JSON. We can even take a similar approach for the set method. The body of the request is decoded as JSON, then set using the data service. Once we have the ID, we return an empty response setting the location HTTP header, telling anything using the API the URL to retrieve the newly created dataset. Besides missing a bit of defensive code like checking for null and empty, this code functions and does what it is supposed to do, until a requirement comes down that the API must now also support XML, as well as JSON. Reading and writing XML isn't anywhere near as easy as JSON, at least not in PHP. Since you need to read and write XML in multiple places, you're going to want to abstract this out into a separate piece of code. In comes the XML processor. Now that we have this class that can read and write XML, you're going to want to update the get and set methods in the controller. The first thing that you need to do is identify what format the data should be in for a particular request. The most sensible way to do this would be to use the accept header, which tells the server what content the client accepts. If the media type provided by the accept header matches the defined one for XML, which is text slash XML, then we're dealing with XML and we need the processor. If not, we can just use JSON encode. We're also setting the content type header in the response to match the accept header or the default value of application slash JSON, which tells the client what format the data is in. These two headers are essentially each other's opposite. Now in the set method, there's going to be something similar, but since the request contains data, we'll use the content type header, not accept. To keep things consistent, we don't want to just manually call JSON encode and JSON decode, so we'll create a JSON processor. And since there are now two processors, it only makes sense to create a text processor interface. Now that the interface is there, we could just create the JSON processor and update the methods. For simplicity, I'm going to focus solely on the get method from now on. So this is fine, it's not too bad, but now requirements are coming in for other formats like CSV and YAML, so you repeat the process and create new processors. As you can see, it's starting to get a bit messy, Every time a new format is added, you have to go and update the get and set methods, as well as anywhere else in the code base that needs access to these processors. This is where the factory method pattern comes in. Rather than duplicate this code, you abstract out the creation of the processor objects. First, you start with an interface, let's call it text processor factory interface, and then you can create an implementation from that. 
This make method is the factory method. It's an abstraction of the logic involved in choosing an implementation of the text processor interface. The idea behind the factory having an interface is that it can be injected into the controller constructor along with the data service. The example here assumes that dependency injection or something equivalent is being used. If you aren't familiar with dependency injection, don't worry, it's something I'll be covering in another video. All that you need to know now is that a mechanism will provide the appropriate instances when constructing an instance of this controller. Now that we have the factory, the get method can be updated to make use of that. And there we have it, a functioning factory method implementation. Now, there are many variations to this particular pattern, as it's one of the more flexible ones. A common variation of this is for a class to have a static make method that creates an instance of itself, commonly known as a virtual constructor. For example, the response class that the get method uses to return a response. This make method could do many things. There may be other classes that extend this one for specific use cases based on the status code or the content type. But with this method's presence, the get method can be updated to make use of it, the second kind of factory method. It is worth noting that the factory method doesn't require parameters. There are plenty of cases where you wouldn't want one. Perhaps you have several factories with each of them only returning one implementation. That's perfectly viable. Since design patterns are templates or guides, you're free to experiment with them and see what you can do. Some of them, like the factory method pattern, have so few rules that it's hard to stray too far from the original plans. And that marks the end of this video. This has been a walkthrough of the factory method design pattern, what it is, how it works, and the problems it was designed to solve. I hope you found this helpful. Thanks for watching this video. If you're interested in seeing more, remember to subscribe. And as always, if you have any feedback or questions, you can reach me on Twitter, Discord, or by email. Happy coding.